Banjo-Kazooie is one of the best platformers of all time. It's an amazing culmination of great art style, level design, music, game mechanics, world building, script writing, it is damn near perfection. It's like, just an accepted idea at this point that Banjo-Kazooie was not only impactful at its time, but a clear example of a game that has survived the test of time. Everyone holds this game in super high regards as a game that not only helped define a genre, but an entire console generation. It's awesome. And then Banjo-Tooie happened and no one really talks about it all that much. You'd think with a game as celebrated as Banjo-Kazooie, the direct sequel would pop up in conversation a whole lot more, but... Yeah, no, that's not the case. It's not that people don't know about this game, but while people are able to go into these long, elaborate essays to explain how all the pieces fit together so beautifully in Kazooie, discussions about Tui tend to focus on how the game is big, and that's about it. Well, to continue on my quest on exploring the entirety of Banjo's legacy, as well as justify the purchase of an Xbox One, let's take a look at the sequel to Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie. The Xbox version this time around is a lot more required. I think a lot of people remember that Tui is all about being bigger in scope, and this was all done at the cost of performance. Holy crap, the frame rate is so rough at times on the 64. It's a game that actually had widescreen support back in the day, which is pretty damn neat actually, but oof, for a good chunk of the game it feels like a slog. Just based on the smoother frame rate alone, the Xbox version is far and away the better way to play this game. The transition did screw up one of the opening cutscenes though, which is pretty funny. The music was composed with the original version's lag in mind, so while the N64 version plays like this, the Xbox version is like this. Wow guys, such a lazy port, you should be ashamed of yourselves. And with the higher resolution, I can finally understand what I'm looking at here. This pixel sandwich on the N64 confused me for years. Also, I'm pretty sure that's a Game Boy camera. No amount of Nintendo to Microsoft rebranding is gonna change that one. That is a Game Boy camera and all of its quote unquote glory. Now, one of the best parts about Banjo-Tooie is that it feels like a genuine continuation of the previous game. So many sequels for platformers usually take place in brand new worlds with new stories and new villains, and oftentimes totally new mechanics. But not this one. Kazooie ended with Grunty falling off her castle and a giant boulder landed on top of her, need I remind you, killing her, and Tui begins with her assistant Klungo, who had a super minor role last time, struggling to get the rock off her for the last two years since that first game. But we cut to a massive digging machine, the Hag-1, crashing through Spiral Mountain, manned by Grunty's sisters, Mingella and Blabelda. And thanks to an always reliable witch spell, they dispose of the rock, and with that, Grunty is saved. She's still dead, but not dead dead. You know how these things go. All the while, Banjo, Kazooie, Bottles, and Mumbo are enjoying a good old game of poker. And this is where some more of that awesome style that the first game had shines through. I really love how fluid these animations are. These are genuine cartoon characters. Oh, but uh, no 2D in sight though. Yeah, Banjo's sister is just MIA for this one. I wouldn't really blame her. Last time she really hung out with these guys, a witch kidnapped her, so... I would leave too. As the drill is making its way through the mountain, it shakes things up pretty violently, and Mumbo goes to check things out. Unfortunately though, now without being spotted by the returning Grunty. So as you would expect, she makes chase. She pulls out a magical spell of her own and shoots it towards Banjo's house. Luckily though, all the characters that matter make their escape. Eh, I'm sure that's just a flesh wound. Not like they would actually kill off one of the main characters in the game before the adventure even begins. Aw, oh, sick, dude. Actual murder. It's rated E for everyone. Oh man, the entirety of Spiral Mountain's been destroyed. It's all in tatters. Not even Grunty's own lair was safe from all of the attacks. As dark and grim as this is, it's actually pretty cool to start off in the same hub world as the first game after some time has passed. There are some extra areas to explore, and once you travel down the hole that the Hag-1 came down in, and encounter Klungo for the first time, we run into the much more pleasant ILO Hags and the Jinjo Village. On top of also having access to every single ability that we learned in the first game, this all adds to that feeling of this being a proper continuation rather than just another adventure. That's really, really cool. I also love the king of the Jinjos, King Jingling. This guy's a trip. 
What, the first game's ending had you think that the Jinjos are some sort of mythical beasts that are able to summon an almighty being of mass destruction? Pfft, nah man, that was all a fluke. They all just want to chill out and this guy's their leader. But don't get too attached though. One press of the suck button on the big old blaster zombifies our beloved king. This, uh, this game's a whole lot darker than the last one. Luckily though, before his zombification, King Jingling instructed us on where to go next, and after one run through Bottle's house and refusing to tell his family the tragic news of his passing, nice guy Banjo over here, we run across the shrine of Master Jiggy Wiggy. That's an amazing name. This is the new location to unlock levels, all by actually completing puzzles this time, which is pretty cool. It controls much better than that side game from Kazooie as well. But with that very first puzzle done, all of that story out of the way, the adventure can finally properly begin. I know that usually platformers don't really do much with its story, but credit where credit's due. Banjo-Tooie added a ton of lore to this world. It introduced a new premise with Grunty going out for revenge. It brought in a brand new world that's connected to the old one without feeling forced. There are plenty of incentives to see the adventure through all the way to the end. Good job, Rare. You did an awesome job with this one. But with all that being said, it's time to finally dive into the meat of the game, the actual gameplay. Oh boy. So, at its core, Tui is just more of Kazooie, but with a much larger scope. The worlds are absolutely massive this time around, with a half a dozen or so different sub-areas within each of them. And rather than being their own self-contained locations, now the entire universe of this game is interconnected. Whether it be from traveling on this huge train that you get access to a few levels in, or by finding hidden pathways scattered about, you can get to any single area in this game a handful of different ways. And that would just be one thing if it was an additional means of fast travel, but often some of the tasks that characters ask of you consist of performing actions in different levels. The prospector here in Glitter Gulch Mine wants his mouse partner back who is held captive in Mayahem Temple. Gobi, the poor guy, can't, can't catch a break, got himself imprisoned in Witchy World on his way to the Lava World, and upon freeing him and by using that aforementioned train, he actually gets to finally go to that Lava World he was talking about in the last game, on the fire side of Hailfire Peaks. My absolute favorite though, we have Mildred ice cube in the ice side of Hailfire Peaks. She lost her husband by way of a blizzard sweeping him up away into the sky in Cloud Cuckoo Land. And after just one little push, you get to reconnect him back with this true love. Oh, a JK, we kill him, but it's okay. Now the water's not hot, so these little pigs in Jolly Rogers Lagoon can go for a swim. Sacrifices had to be made. And on top of the returning moveset from Kazooie, Tui is all about once again constantly adding to it with so, so many different moves and abilities. It is crazy. Now you can aim your eggs in first person, either while on the ground or while flying. There's different elemental eggs that you can use now with fire, ice, and explosive, as well as one that shoots out a tiny robotic bird that you can then control and explode on command. You can use Kazooie as a drill. For maneuverability, you can grab on ledges now and shimmy across them. And you're even able to split the duo up when you touch the appropriate pads. Aw, oh, sick dude, that was totally worth an achievement. With this new ability, now both Banjo and Kazooie have their own unique set of solo moves. As you move forward throughout the adventure, it almost feels like three entirely different characters here, since each one is able to do things that the other configurations can't. And the feeling of constant growth is nice, but a lot of these are implemented to fix problems that shouldn't have been introduced in the first place. It's also pretty annoying at times being blocked out of a move just because you're not playing as the right configuration, requiring you to add quite a bit of backtracking into the mix. It is relatively easy getting back to that point with the appropriate character, but even then, it's still not ideal. Just not terrible. Oh yeah, and also Banjo can use Kazooie as a gun. You know, I think that's more animal abuse, but with this series that has it so often, I'm kind of losing track. This is so weird, man. I guess, I guess because Rare had success with Goldeneye and Perfect Dark, then why not do the same thing with Banjo? The oddest part about the entire thing? These segments are actually pretty fun. Never would I have thought that these two things coming together would have made a good fit, but color me surprised, they're not bad. This one mission really sucks, the time limit is super strict on it, but aside from that. Now I know the big question on your mind is who is giving you these moves if Bottles bit the big one. Introducing Bottles' brother, Drill Sergeant Jam Jars, who is not only your new teacher, but he also takes on this game's rhyming duties as well. 
What you need is an aiming sight, hit the target, then you might first person view by pressing Y, hit left trigger or right trigger to fire with accuracy. All right, I think, uh, I think the Xbox port is a bit rougher than I thought. It made a lot more sense with the N64 buttons. Oh, but it's okay. Jam Jars is a bit of a goof. Worlds also have proper boss fights now too. Yeah, Kazooie had some stronger enemy encounters here or there, but nothing that really felt like a proper battle aside from the final fight with Gruntilda. Here, every single stage has a big baddie to tango with, and with how wide the moveset is and the bosses sometimes taking full advantage of that, these are a much appreciated addition. I mean, Old King Cole is pretty dumb. He, he just wanders aimlessly while you pelt him with eggs. Uh, that's uh, it's, it's the worst, it's the worst fight in the game. But for the most part, these are a real highlight for the adventure. Mr. Patch, the strange wobbly inflatable thing, by far my favorite one. It's mainly for his awesome theme song, which is still so damn good, but this is the one fight that stuck out to me the most out of all of them. Well, aside from Lord Wu Fak Fak, just, just for the name, uh, now I wonder if I'm gonna be demonetized for saying that. Mumbo Jumbo has a starring playable role this time too. By collecting these magical creatures called Globos, you're able to toss them into Mumbo's little bag, where he can then harness that magic when standing on his specific pads. He can bring a giant stone golem to life for you to control and wreak havoc, add oxygen to water so you can swim without worrying about catching your breath, lift a rock, it's exciting stuff all around. Those Globos can also be given to this Native American stereotype, Humba Wumba, who now takes control over transforming Banjo into a new creature. There's a little stone Banjo that lets you talk to other stone creatures and take place in a kickball tournament. Always thought that was cute. An adorable roaring T-Rex that, with the power of Mumbo, you're able to play as in two different sizes. The washing machine joke from the first game became a real thing now, where you can shoot underwear. That's hilarious. There's a TNT detonator where you can, you can detonate TNT. There's a, there's a snowball. All right, some of these aren't that great. They all perform as expected, at least. There are plenty of things that you simply can't get to as Banjo or Kazooie, and that's where these transformations come in. And none of them are outright bad, but some of them are just not all that exciting. Although the B from Click Clock Wood returns, it's a little weird though. Like, you guys, you guys didn't want to even try making an animation for this? So yeah, man, they really added a lot to this game. Just conceptually, Banjo-Tooie is far and away better than Kazooie. You got brand new moves, interconnected worlds, you got unique playstyles, pretty fun boss fights. There's a lot of cool stuff here. But it's when it all comes together that it starts to fall flat. There is one major issue that prevents this game from being greater than it should be, Canary Mary, oh my god, I hate her so much. So like, not only is she an absolutely terrifying looking specimen, all she wants to do is race you, but that consists of doing nothing but mashing buttons like a psychopath for minutes at a time. Oh wait, 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 but not too fast. No, 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 you gotta mash him at a moderate speed. That's the only path to success. The racing glitter gulch mine is whatever, it's just more annoying than anything else, but in Cloud Cuckoo Land. Oh, oh man, this sucks. Early stage arthritis, here I come. Okay, in actuality, the backtracking. That's, that, that's, that's the main problem. Sure, the worlds are huge this time, but that isn't inherently a problem. Often you're restricted from progression towards a jiggy because you just didn't have the needed ability. And that, coupled with areas not really having much in the way of interesting landmarks, when the time eventually comes to return, half the struggle is then finding just where exactly you need it to go. I've heard people have issue with how much darker the tone of the game is, from a more muted color palette used for the levels, and a less bouncy, more atmospheric soundtrack to accompany it, but that's all fine to me. That's not an excuse for making these locations so barren and a hassle to explore, especially when, sometimes, the clue to completing a level's task rests in another level. So unless mentally you're keeping on top of things at all times, it is very easy to get confused. Witchy World is the main exception to this in my opinion. Every area of this level feels different, so I never once struggled to complete it. The same goes for Cloud Cuckoo Land. 
Yeah, it's big, but the outside has so many interesting landmarks on them. Big cheese, a trash can, there are bees all the way at the top of the mountain. I can easily remember what's going on here, because I can't make sense of any of this. It's awesome. The majority of Jolly Rogers Lagoon is a massive, confusing underwater maze. Pterodactyl Land is just open and empty for the sake of it, just to make room for the big T-Rex, which only gets used a couple of times. And Grunty Industries. Oh man, Grunty Industries. This stage is multi- Multiple floors of dank, gray, uninteresting looking warehouse with doorways leading up and down and all around. I spent just over three hours getting everything in here. It felt like genuine insanity at times. The scope of things here does make the game feel like a much grander adventure for sure, but it's at the sacrifice of satisfying moment to moment gameplay. A lot of times you're just spent walking to a destination that you're not even sure if that's the right place to go, and sometimes the game just tells you to wait. Oh, fun. Luckily though, in the Xbox version, there is a brand new hint system that does help point you in the right direction. It doesn't fully alleviate the frustration though, you just get vague sentences that tell you what the objectives are. If this game got the full remake treatment and had an in-game map that you can have show up at all times, then it would probably be totally fixed. The number of collectible notes has been reduced as well. I was always of the mindset that they helped push the player to see every aspect of a level back in Kazooie, so here it's a bit tougher to do so when there are less of them in bigger areas. Yeah, the overall count is still at 100, but it's chopped up into 16 nests of 5 and 1 nest of 20. I guess it was to counter Donkey Kong 64 having 500 bananas per level, but in my opinion this is far too on the opposite side of the spectrum. Oh yeah, and also that lovely little jiggy animation from the first game that was pretty iconic, completely gone now, which personally I'm, I'm still pretty upset about it. And actually, come to think of it, the talking items that explained what they did in Kazooie that's gone too. Now everything is explained by jam jars. I mean, that's fine, it's not really a problem, but it does feel like they removed some of the charm on purpose without much substance to replace it with. Ultimately, all of these things combined lead to a less satisfying experience, which sucks because again, I think Tui does so many things right and it did have the potential to be way better than Kazooie. Like when you know you're working towards something in this game and you can see the reward within arm's reach, it is pretty fun. And just based on the expanded moveset, simply controlling Banjo is much more enjoyable than last time. I just think Rare was too ambitious with this project, seeing just how much stuff they could fit into a single cartridge, which, to be fair, is something Rare was pretty known for back in the day. But I'll give the game this much, any sense of confusion or overload coming from the things that you can and can't do and all of the objects to collect, it's not as ridiculous as Donkey Kong 64, where that game had like a million things to collect and every button and every button combination had a different thing that you can do, it was very confusing. Now that game was a nightmare. And with all the stuff that Tui has going for it, there was even some content that didn't make it into the final product. This has been like one of my favorite things in the entirety of gaming for a long time now, Bottles Revenge, a mode where a second player is able to play as the newly evil spirit of the recently deceased mole, where they can control enemies and try to fight the other player as Banjo. And they cut it before the game released! This is all thankfully still within the game's code, so it's nothing that some emulation can't solve. And on top of the massive single player campaign, there's also a pretty substantial multiplayer mode, where many of these score based challenges that are found within the main game can be played with multiple players, which is actually pretty fun. It may seem pretty forced given the genre of 3D platformer having just a ton of mini games like this, but considering how multiplayer focused the N64 was, this makes perfect sense. And of course, then we have Stop and Swap. Time to finally talk about this can of worms. So this was a feature that was meant to transfer data between Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie by way of swapping out cartridges mid playthrough, since early models of the N64 had 10 seconds of RAM that would maintain data despite the cartridge no longer being in the console. However, newer models of the 64 reduced at that time to only one second, so for fear of, I'm assuming, kids breaking games and consoles on a regular basis, this had to to be scrapped. The way it was meant to work was that there was a handful of colored eggs as well as an ice key hidden within Banjo-Kazooie that was teased in the game's ending. They are still accessible by entering in stupidly massive cheat codes in the N64 version, but they're also unlockable by having saved data from Banjo-Tooie on the Xbox version. 
So you go to the different hiding spots where these items are located, it plays a massive fanfare, makes it feel like it's a really big deal when you get them, and then with the eggs in tow, you're able to go back to Banjo-Tooie and find this brand new character, Heggy, and she will hatch them for you. I gotta say, after 10 plus years of anticipation, I am super excited to see what I get. Okay, you get one new close combat move. Okay, you don't really do close combat much anyway. Jinjo as a multiplayer character, homing eggs, an Xbox theme, a ga gamer pick. All right, cool, man. This, this whole thing really paid off. At least with the ice key, if you find the massive safe, you gain access to a Mega Globo, which you bring to Humble Wumba's hut in the Isle of Hags to transform Kazooie into a dragon. Dude, it's like, it's like super pointless. There's no time in the game whatsoever where blowing fire is useful in the slightest, but I don't care. This is, this is still pretty awesome. It's certainly a better move than being able to abuse Kazooie at the push of a button. <laughs> Some of those unlockables were still accessible in Banjo-Tooie on the 64 by finding and defeating the three of them spread throughout Spiral Mountain and the Jinjo Village, they originally would give you some of the colored stop and swap eggs, but now on Xbox you just get shiny eggs. That's it, nothing, nothing special, Jam Jars says, hey, good job, and uh, that's, that's about it. Ah, uh, okay, it's a, it's a really big letdown after so many years of mystery, but the whole idea of stop and swap is still such a super fascinating concept for me. For years, there was always this massive mystery surrounding these items that you could never get access to, but you could just see them. They're within arm's reach, but you can do nothing about it. It always led to really fun discussions talking about what could have been. And besides, a game rewarding you for playing previous games in the same series is something that I don't think is done enough in gaming nowadays. It's still something really cool. Now these items do unlock things in nuts and bolts as well, but uh, next time. So, if it wasn't obvious enough at this point, I am definitely in the camp of people who think that Kazooie is way better than Tui. On individual things, Tui does do things better, but on the whole, Kazooie is... Like I said, that game is damn near perfect. It's... it would have been really hard to top that game anyway. But, one of the things that Tui does do better than Kazooie is the ending. And this was a clever segue to talk about the ending. Once you finally get your hands on the appropriate amount of Jiggies and complete every puzzle that Jiggy Wiggy Shrine has to offer you, it is time to head to the tippy top of ILO Hag's Cauldron Keep. And I love this place. Gruntilda being out for revenge and retiring her rhyming ways makes her a bit more of a serious villain. The darker themes make for a more serious adventure. And finally reaching the top of a huge mountain after a long adventure makes for a more epic conclusion. Being reminded of the bad guy's existence a little bit more often would have been nice. You just fight Klungo a couple times and that's it. But overall, I'm a fan. There is another fun and wacky quiz segment. But instead of doing the over-the-top board game, it's a trivia fight to the death, and Grunty is not afraid to put her own sisters who saved her at risk. Yeah, it's not as charming as the Furnace of Fun, I guess, but I wasn't ever a huge fan of that anyway, so... I like this. Mostly because we don't have to deal with any of that Brentilda garbage. That alone makes this way better. After getting through the game show safely, Grunty once again makes an escape while we let some credits roll by. Banjo is able to reverse the effects of the Suck Blow Machine and bring bottles back to life as well as unzombify King Jingling. And with the help of Dingpot, Grunty's old assistant, making a grand return. It's time for the final encounter against the evil witch in her giant drill tank. It's a good old-fashioned shoot-off, too. This is a pretty fun final boss. There's plenty of obstacles to avoid and questions to answer, because why not? It's a much more engaging fight than the final boss of the first game, in my opinion. But before long, she's toast anyway. We saw that coming. We killed her. Again. Banjo and friends celebrate their victory with a party at Bottle's place. The good guys kick around Grunty's head for a little bit, which was actually censored in Japan, cause I guess this was just too violent for you guys? She warns us of her impending return in Banjo 3, which still hasn't happened yet, and every time I say that out loud, it makes me sad. And that ends Banjo 2E. And then Microsoft bought Rareware and it's been a disaster ever since. But yeah, that's Banjo-Tooie. Not a bad game, but it does feel like Rare developed it without really keeping in mind the stuff that made Banjo-Kazooie so special in the first place. This game does have its fans, and if you're one of the people out there who do prefer this sequel to the original, more power to you. But I think as time goes on, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Banjo-Kazooie, that tends to be the preferable option. 
Maybe a full-on remake that the likes of Crash, Spyro, and even Spongebob got would make this adventure a lot more worthwhile in a modern-day setting, but who knows, time will tell on that one. But uh, yeah, I guess, I guess it's all downhill from here, right? Because next time we're taking a look at Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. Apparently the game that killed the franchise, so I am very excited to finally play that one. There are the two Game Boy Advance games as well, Grunty's Revenge and Banjo Pilot, so we'll knock all of those out in one final stop on this adventure. But until then, with the extra little bit of time I have with you all, I want to take another look at Rare Replay. I want to take another look at a game from Rare's past. Last time we took a look at Attic Attack, and that was... Yeah, we just went way too far back in Rare's timeline. How about we take a look at Saber Wolf? You know, the main character from that game does show up in Banjo-Tooie, so that character must have a great legacy if they wanted to put him into a Banjo game. Let's check it out. Nope. <laughs> 